Hi, Michelle. How are you doing? Hey, Daniel. Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's always good to see you, hon. What you been thinking about? Oh, uh, all sorts of things. <laughs> but I, I was thinking recently about um, just like, I guess I've been thinking about it. Well, one, I like just talking to random people in random places, not random people, but strangers, I should say, but in safe places. Don't worry, yeah, folks. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Nobody is random. Everybody is special. <laughs> but um you know, just talking to people in public and, and hearing about their stories is, I've always enjoyed that. Like since I was a young girl, I think it's because my mom and my grandma, my maternal grandmother would do it a lot. So mm. it's almost like you never met a stranger kind of concept and you just yeah. sort of talk to the person next to you on the train or whatever. Now, sure. I think it's important to be mindful if they've got like, you know, they're clearly trying to read or something not to talk with them. But the point of the matter is, is that you can learn a lot from just listening to people talk or whatever they want to talk about, you know? And I think also in light of um, just also the great work that's happening at Theory Underground, you know, I think that there's I've been thinking about the relationship people have with work and, you know, time and um, how people like kind of thinking about it like psychoanalytically, like what things get kind of revealed and how people talk about work, especially for me as a, as a mother and how women talk about work outside of the home, inside of the home and all of that. So it's it, it does like it's kind of can be very revealing what people say and don't say or how they say things. And yeah, that's what I've been thinking about. Well, that's interesting. And Mr. Jockin, it's good to see you. So I hope you're doing hey, well. Thomas. No, it's very interesting. I mean, there's a few things that when you ask someone a question, whatever answer they directly give you is usually the least uh, likely to be true mm -hmm. answer. Uh, you know, where there actually well, something is hiding something, maybe. Yeah, there you know. can be something hiding. Now, it's not necessarily deception, but it could be hiding like an entire background or worldviews or assumptions. I mean, some of the great insight of great literature and psychoanalysis is this idea that we should pay attention not just to what is directly said, but what's kind of in the background yeah. of things. I think that's exactly right. Mr. Luber, good to see you, sir. I hope you have been well. And, and I think I think honestly, a lot of thinking is actually being aware of those background dynamics, that the things mm -hmm. that are just in the foreground are not all that is there. It's the ability to keep your eye on something invisible. Which, of course, yeah. is paradoxical, but so much of the ability to think, I think, is that ability to keep your eye right. on something that's invisible. It makes me think of Mr. Lubert's work on theme. When you're writing a story, you have to keep your eye on a theme that's everywhere and nowhere at the same time. What in the world does that mean? So likewise, when you ask people about their day, you know, you're looking for that background of their worldview or assumptions or what they think about things or ethics that is, you know, everything they say is participating in. And yet at the same time, nothing is participating in it. And I think when you look at Lacan or some of the great philosophers, there's this kind of idea of there's this thing that is in the invisible, and yet it is precisely unveiled in what is visible. You know, it's not really visible versus invisible per se. Everything is invisible with the I and in parentheses, but there's this dual character in the same way that you have this notion on Mr. Jockin's work of beauty. You know, beauty is a thing that is always there potentially but then it's there suddenly and you're looking for those glimmers. And I think what you're saying there on listening to people speak, I'd, I'd be curious to hear you say more on it, Michelle, on when you hear yeah. people speak, there are kind of glimmers of something yeah. in the background behind it. And you're always looking for those glimmers, which is an indication of the thing that's behind there and that there's something there that's worth l listening out for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, we also had um, like a repairman come by this morning for the dishwasher and the thing is, is like just hearing him talk and just listening to the things that he would bring up or say there's something about you know again like i said the the, the great work being done at theory underground as well the, this idea of the working class or like the people kind of behind this behind the scenes but like that kind of help run the world in a sense like keep the world running i should say that is really fascinating and um I think too the the idea, especially when it comes to the 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 that that sort of spot of working inside of the home versus outside of the home, and well, how people talk about that is interesting because sometimes it, what it reveals is that we're not always willing to be very direct about what we actually want to do. Like we have to say that we want to do this other thing because if we were to be very direct with what that also implies, it would it would be like, well, I don't mean it like that, you know? Um, and, and maybe it's just like about coming to terms with like the raw radical honesty um, about, you know, 
uh, about like our relationship, in, you know, to work or or to ourselves or something like that. But you know, just th- thinking about examples of of, um, you know, just again people's relationship to their work because it's gonna it like that that does really impact somebody's life. You know, like like if somebody's going to a to a job or something and they kind of are always like, oh, like I hate this job, da da da. Um, but really like um they also don't want to be just staying at home. Like so it's it's kind of it's it's a it's more complex because it's not just simply that they hate their job. Maybe they do, but um they might hate if they're just bored at home all the time too. So like kind of being radically honest of the bothness of often the, those types of situations. Um and also the fact that like if you if you kind of always think about your job as that now maybe it can play a scapegoat role right like it's just the job's fault or something but it also can change your engagement with that work like in terms of how you show up how you do your job how you work so anyways i'm i'm that's i was just kind of interested in thinking about that lately given some like given listening and talking with the dishwasher man and talking to the like the lady at the library and stuff like that just there's so much that can be learned from like um just what people reveal and show about the, the our human nature in just what they share, you know, what they volunteer. Um, so anyways, yeah, it, 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 it's interesting. No, I, I think one, if someone chooses to say X instead of Y, there's a question of how they decided or why they decided to say X versus Y. And I think there's a combination of things. So for example, you know that if you say you like to go to work, then there's some way that that may lose a kind of morality socially because it's more noble to go to a job you don't like to go to sometimes than to go to one you want to go to. But then there's also the thing of, you know, so there can be an emphasis on saying I don't like work, but then there is a lot of work that's quite terrible and you wouldn't go unless they paid you for it. But then there's also the situation where you actually don't want to be at home, even though you say, oh, I want to, I wish I had more time at home, but actually you don't. You also just know you're supposed to say that because you would be a bad person if you didn't say that. So then you're trying to cover it with the ethic of work, but it's all just a complicated mix of all of these different things. And and it just goes to show you that if we're going to talk about human beings, simple categories or single motivations or what I've called mono, you know, we talk about mono theories, single theories to understand how things work or single motivations or single explanations are very problematic. And I think this actually, like if we come to, there may be an incentive for us ourselves to genuinely believe that we only have a single motivation for what we do because then mechanisms of self-deception are easier to follow through. But of course, it becomes very, very dire if we then project single motivations onto other people because then we actually tend to be less understanding and tend to think to treat things simply. And I think these can, this kind of mistake can hurt family, can hurt friendships, can hurt community, when really it's just not so simple. Human beings like to go to work sometimes, but they also like to be at home sometimes, but sometimes it's okay to want to go to work. But then there are different kinds of work. Then there's the work you're paid for, and then there's the work that you have a drive for, right? I think also too, it's interesting, because I think it is tied to this interesting situation where you cannot, where humans can't approach, like T.S. Eliot says in the Four Quartet, you know, human beings can only take with so much um, humanity, so much uh, reality, right? There's something about reality that must be taken on indirectly to be approached fully, because that's the real. But then when you think about it, there's also things like beauty that it seems quite difficult to say, I'm going to do something beautiful today. Like, you're too direct. It doesn't work like that. You have to, like, cultivate a garden. You can't directly grow a plant. And in one sense, you can, but there's also more of a kind of cultivation, right? It's like Mr. Luber and I have been talking on the idea, you can't directly state the theme. That then tends to make it a moral. It has to be something that's indirectly always shown in what is present that indeed shows the theme, but the theme is not reducible to that. It's just very interesting that I think in the way that people talk about work or their lives or what they like to do, that you actually see that dynamic kind of that's at play. But let me pass it to Mr. Jockin and then back to you, Michelle. Mr. Jockin, it's good to see you, sir. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, Michelle, I think you're making great points, right? And Daniel, I think you're picking back on that really great. I think that term glimmer is actually a very, very potent word or imagery because I'm, th- I'm reminded of Aquinas. He talks about the highest expression of being is person. When I, what that means is in this context is that the human being, when actually addressed and investigated for what it is, like to actually encounter it, it's like this uh, kaleidoscope of, in, of infinite complexity, right? 
that the whole point. And then it's kind of and versus the ideologies are kind of static modes of your ex. You're the you're the you're the housekeeper. You're the electrician, right? There's a certain uh, narrative structure of a certain protocol, right? That's not the totality of a human being. Actually, it's funny. I've talked to students about this. You know, the question of integrity, having a soul that's in, in integrity, the general opinion I find from my students is no, we're a bunch of artificial fragmentations. We're a student in this context. We're an employee in this context. And in fact, this literally when we hear the idea of schizophrenic capitalism, it's like that's the, like, the expression of it. There is no integrated whole that you're this one that it's almost like actually that it's what happened was instead of seeing a singular entity with a multiplicity of glimmer, like almost like a gemstone with so with infinite fractal faces that can be investigated and tilted and angled to see the different lights of their motivations and intentions and their spirit. Uh, we've actually taken that gemstone and shattered it into like a thousand pieces uh, based on our particular protocols that we're put under. And I can influence that language too, by the way, like you're more, the more, the product, like protocol uh, versus code versus decorum, right? A, a certain, or ethos. It's a, that's not an accidental language. Uh, the idea that moral judgment gets delegated out to some external entity that's based on a protocol of an institution to tell you how to operate under certain mechanisms and, dec and decorations versus a given, right? Basically a cultural given. Um, I'm riffing slightly on what's being said, but also another note is on that note about boredom and that kind of idea of the, of the glimmer of reality in the sense that every act of reality is beautiful in another light. Like basically one of the motion, one of the signs of wisdom is that you literally find the beauty in watching a dish, cleaning up a, a baby's poop. You know what I mean? Like the things that generally people would normally go, what are you doing? This is either mundane existence of a slave or this is just minutia, or this is boring, literally boring. There's no epistemic value in this engagement. It's just a necessity, of, an annoyance, a default. Uh, boredom is normally a sign. It's a kind of mode of ignorance, but of a kind of a, a kind of a moral slash subjectivity ignorance. Like you don't see the point of this. Because even the most mundane acts of cleaning feces off a baby, basically, can still, it actually has a purpose. Like, I mean, there is. Like, you don't want your child, first of all, one, you care, if you care about your child, you don't want them in their feces, number one. Number two, you have your, your basically, your gross, your, your, uh, oh God, which one is it? Uh, your, your gross, uh, I'm forgetting what instinct it is, not disgust, there you go. The disgust instinct, uh, you're kicking it out of pure biological intention, intentions, um, uh, but the main point is you don't want your baby to have di diaper rash, for example. Like there, like there's implications just for that alone. Um, let alone, like again, like Daniel brought up with the training, right? The cultivation that usually almost all greatness does demand a kind of cult, a, a kind of submission to boredom. You actually have to overcome the boredom. So you have to overcome it to come up to something to get greatness out of it. Like reading philosophy is super boring. Like you get started, it's super boring. It's just ridiculous. Like who's going to spend a leisure time doing this? It only gets interesting after about five years. I'm, I, we talked about this too, like, I think an episode or two ago in the net. We talked about this, the idea of the, Daniel, you spent 10 years doing all this research. It's so obvious. Like that, that and it's kind of, it's almost like this quantity becomes a quality element because of the sticky notes. I brought that up. You just like, you just keep flying out all these screens of sticky notes in the video. Uh, it was like a, a very, um, uh, if uh, empirical kind of demonstration of the accumulation over time necessary for any kind of greatness or any capacity to show up. Um, so just riffing on these points of work and time. And I think also noted here is heedlessness too, by the way, just want to like close on that thread. One last thing. I was just listening to a lecture and I was also with, and Justin Murphy's kind of reading group and other life. They had a reading group this morning. It was really good on Dionysus. Uh, overcoming life, basically, I mean, victory and, and virtue. Um, and one of the notes in there was this discussion of cosmopolitanism, which the cynics are usually, and that's what Dionysus is saying, he's like, his Dionysius is saying, he's saying that he's a citizen of the world. But it's really interesting, because like, when he does that, he's like the most grounded, um, like salt of the earth, he's literally living in poverty. Versus cosmopolitan today, they are literally who rely on electricians, 
the help, basically, no one likes to talk about this fact, but the help, basically, that sits in the background, that, trust me, I work at a university, I see it. There's literally a class structure. No one was talking about it. There's the electricians, the people who work the grounds and all that. Their decorum and acts in relationship to the faculty, completely different. There is absolutely a class structure I definitely see in the interplay. Uh, but it's so interesting because it's cosmopolitanism. It's like these faculty members are, and it's totally true. Like I'm an example of it because I immigrated here. I'm saying immigrate because I am in a different culture. I'm in, I'm in Georgia. I'm in North Georgia. In North Georgia. In one sense, I could easily be blasé, have no interest, no commitment to understand the local culture, its history, its context. I'm just like this little e. I'm like this abstractional ether, just glopped in to basically interact. Right? I have no, with literally no groundedness, no almost like a heedlessness of cosmopolitanism. So, and that's why I'm tied up to say the idea of like basically a lot of this cosmopolitans today have no interest. And understand what the electrician's viewpoint is, that kind of seeing that prism of their existence and their reality. No, that is outstanding. I appreciate it. First, thank you for your kind words. And second, it was very sad that I had to miss the reading group. I've really enjoyed the reading groups, like the one we did on Blood Meridian, City of God with Justin Murphy. I've, I've really enjoyed those in the other life. I think that it was, have been wonderful discussions. Uh, and uh, that, that was really great they did that. Philip, it's good to see you today, sir. And it's very interesting because what you're saying, I agree that there's something about boredom that seeks of a kind of, speaks of a kind of ignorance to experience the beauty in the everyday moments. So that's a very interesting idea. And, it, and yet there's also something about the lack of experiencing the real that entails a kind of ignorance. But when you're trying to get to the real of people, if you do it too quickly or in a non-artful way, it can destroy the relationship or overwhelm you. So it's very interesting because there seems to be like in regard to beauty, a kind of gradual process to get to the place where you can have some more permanent state. Like, I think I always go back to that image of kind of Beatrice moving Dante along. She is moving Dante along so Dante can have a permanent presence or a kind of permanent orbit on the beautific vision. So it's interesting to think that there's some kind of gradual process to something more permanent, a gradual process to handle more and more beauty, gradual process to handle more and more reality, gradual process to handle more and more diversity, and then it can characterize your more permanent life. And then the question becomes, what would it look like to have a society that is more intentional about those things? And what are the skills of those different things? And I think when you mentioned boredom, it's also interesting if Patricia Sachs is kind of correct that the birth of boredom as a concept, it kind of blows my mind that when you look in literature, Boredom's not even an idea until the like the 18th century. And it like it corresponds so much with the existence of wealth, capitalism, and things like that. And it seems as if the problem is the more and more we get things that save us from using energy, like because we have technology to do things for us, we get out of the habits of using energy. And escaping boredom requires some sort of cultivation of skills, ergo energy use, so that you then are able to gradually move to the state of permanence. So there's something here, because I have been thinking. Um, a lot about this kind of energy use. We talked about the problem with a cell phone is that if you have it in your pocket all day long, you're making decisions not to use it. So it's draining your energy. And I did appreciate Mr. Lindbergh's uh, piece about uh, an hour ago about taking your cell phone, putting it in a box and putting it on a shelf until a particular period of time in the day. Now, again, my, uh, my bias against the cell phone. Like I said, I understand it for work and things, but the problem is people using a cell phone without a limiting principle. Like if there's no limiting principle, then it's a perpetual, you know, like an energy use. If it's like, oh, it's for work, blah, 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 but otherwise. But anyway, so I'm really interested in the energy use question. And it seems as if a lot of, I'm also interested if there's something about self-deception that is part of saving energy. Because like, if I have to like, if like, because, you know, we started at the beginning saying, well, there are actually times where I like to go to work because I don't like to be at home. But does that make me a bad person? Well, that there's a kind of energy use and having to explain to yourself how it's okay to like both of those. And wouldn't it be just far easier if you could self deceive yourself into never thinking about that? And so I wonder if there's something about self-deception, seeking um, given, seeking um, all of these different things that's part of avoiding the tendency of explanation or always having to get an explanation. Now, obviously, and then I'll pass it to Michelle and Mr. Luber, obviously belonging again is all about with givens being energy saving. And I just wonder if there's something about actually the self-deception, which is the process of avoiding seeing what you do that would then require you to have to arrive at an explanation for why it's okay for what you do that requires way too much energy so you figure out ways to avoid those conversations to yourself like why is it okay to sometimes not want to be at home 
Doesn't that make you a bad person because you don't want to be about your family? Why doesn't it make you a bad person? Well, now you're in philosophy and a lot of people don't have training in that or psychoanalysis. So you get stuck with this thing you can't explain that then drains your energy all day long. So I wonder if there's something about that that's part of it. Um, but let me but let me give it to Michelle and then Mr. Luber. Michelle, please. Yeah, great to great to see you all. That was all really great. Um, um Daniel and Thomas and I um <clears throat> yeah, I think I just was I, I wanted to just add really quick, like to be more specific on the whole working topic. Um, I think it's very interesting to think about it. Like, okay, that's that's a good framing. And this is just an example. I'm not trying to make some sort of like um, you know, judgment about one way or the other. But it's like the idea of of sort of this radical honesty with yourself about like, am I just not cultivating the capacity to be home? Because I always just want to get out, like, just for example. Um, it's like with, and, and it kind of makes me think of something, Thomas Jock, and you've said a while ago on Icons, back when I did the Rookmacher uh, Boober session at, with Javier, but like this idea that we used to have icons for, that we would look to, that would kind of give us a sense of what it means to be um, like industrious or or like, what it because now like now there's kind of this fragmentation of like the Enneagram and like the, the all these personality tests and all this sort of like it used to be that like women would look to the icon of Mary let's just take this example okay and this would be like this standard of what it meant to be a hard-working person who would challenge yourself but like today if a mom's kind of like well I'm just a working mom. Like I just would rather be outside of the house, working outside of the house. And I'll just, you know, I'll do daycare or gra grandma's going to take care of the kids or something like this. N again, no judgment. Maybe a woman feels that way, but is like, is there an under, is there a, is there, that's her honesty with herself, right? It's like, I'm just, you know, I'm just a working mom, just being honest with myself. Right. But like, is there a layer underneath that, that like the honesty is she doesn't like to change diapers. And to your point, Thomas, like there is a beauty in changing diapers. There is a beauty in the this, you know, just all of the things that go with that. And it's like, is there a deeper layer of, I'm just not like allowing myself to become patient enough to do that sort of thing, you know? Now at the same time, somebody could counter that and say, well, you're not cultivating the the ability to trust and let your kids be watched by some, you know, with by a loving family member or whatever, like you're not being willing to individuate or whatever, do your own stuff as a mother because you just have to be like with, you know, you kind of have to be with your kids. So it's like, I can see the points from all these perspectives, but there's a hyper fragmentation of this. Um, I'm just speaking from a, from a female perspective and a mother perspective where what like where's like, yes, there's a risk in the icon because who makes the icon and can they usurp it and now make it something that's like disastrous. But the religious connotations of it, of the female having something that you look to to know what it meant to become a, you know, to learn her like fully her own biology, her own fertility, her own self, like that was something that seemed really important. And now is it is it like to just say, well, it's my personality not to learn how to find joy in washing dishes or to, to sustain diaper changing every single day, every single hour of the day through the night. Like, you know, now one can say a mother's always gonna be a mother. So when she's working, she has a tremendous task of having to juggle even more, right? Like her job, her kids, she's still gonna do diaper changing, guarantee you that. So it's like, but it's just that, there's a sort of weird thing today with our with personality tests and stuff where it becomes like now we've got this there was an icon and now it's a fragmentation of what's your personality and you know now you just can say well that's just my personality you know and um and I think how this relates to work and kind of be making us like hopefully more challenged and more better human beings is like is that just, is there like a partial avoidance in that? Now, the avoidance of the traditional roles or like using some a religious icon is that perhaps you aren't challenging yourself in another way. But work, like work that's like grueling, like coal mining, you probably want to stay at home. Like if you if you had to do coal mining, it, it's just interesting because like the nature of work has changed so dramatically over time with technology and such things. So it's just, it's it just, I don't know. There's something about the fact that tech, that when we have this fragmentation of what we should look to for and we can say well why are you having to look to anything to who how you should be or who you should be it was like we do mirror number one and we will often need sometimes inspiration examples people who can say like okay they did it so it can be done like that's a that's a beautiful reminder so just just thinking about that like that's i'm, I'm these are all over the place thoughts but i'm 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 interested in this a lot from like the 
woman female perspective and i'm sure the male, male perspective has its own uh iteration of this so yeah that's what i'm just saying thank you no, I think um, I think a lot of people look at I am an INTP as an icon and I have to become that or an ENTJ or an Enneagram 5. I think what to me is very interesting is it's something about all of the mechanisms humans have to avoid conscious energy use. Because if I am a mom, then I don't have to think about working or I don't have to think about going outside of the home because there's a danger there where you get the empty nest stuff or the overattachment, right? We have the mom that over identified, but then you have the, well, I'm a worker. And, and it's also, so then I don't have to think about it anymore. And men definitely do this as well. So it's interesting because I guess when I talk about the cell phone, the cell phone is an unconscious energy use. That's really bad. But then there's a no energy use, which is almost boredom. That's really bad. But then there seems to be something like a conscious energy use where you are consciously not letting yourself use categories to avoid thinking. It seems to have a lot to do with, you know, Cadell was saying this the other day, never letting yourself stop thinking. Oh, that seems to be a lot of it. And and I think, too, when people say, oh, I'm an, you know, the man made, and then I'll give it to Mr. Luber and Philip, you know, it's something like when the man says, I'm an engineer, it's also a way of don't make me think about who I am when I'm talking to someone. I told you who I am. Don't question it. So I am also putting up a kind of shield from having my, from being forced into thinking. Right. Because if I tell you I'm an engineer, then you need then I basically said there's nothing to talk about. So don't you dare. <laughs> and so there's also it's interesting to think about increasingly. I'm just interested in these dynamics of energy use. And there's something about unconscious energy use, which I think technology does and leads to mental illness, frankly. Then there's no energy use. That seems to be a problem. But then there's conscious energy use, which is terrifying. Uh, but necessary for a certain cultivation to apprehend beauty and higher forms of life and relationships and so on and so forth. But let me pass it to Mr. Luber. Also, Mr. Jockin, down in Georgia, I hope you didn't freeze to death because I wasn't sure there for a bit. Uh, but let me give it to Mr. Luber and then Philip. Mr. Luber, I hope you're doing well, sir. Yeah, I am doing pretty good. It's good to see everyone. Um, nice haircut, Daniel. And uh, I, per usual, uh, so much to take in. Uh, my mind has just went through like three different valleys and mountains of thought uh so thanks for that um now where to i guess i'll just go backwards i'll go backwards uh i think michelle what you were saying was really good um it just makes me think of the question of like how do i know when the other's thinking and it just makes me think about the net conversation last week with feedback and like what Daniel was saying made me think a little bit about feedback and partnership. And uh, essentially, you kind of know when someone's thinking when they're making you think. And like that, I mean, that's, I think, pretty self-evident. And then that also makes me get a little sad in a sense, because it's like, most of the time, who makes me think? Like, once a week, I come here, I think. Like other people are making me think, but most of the other time it's like the books that I'm reading. And like that, that's like, it has no notch on other people. It's just, I guess, what, uh, you know, fancies my brain, so to speak. Um, I think there's definitely something to that. Um, I lost my thought. I, Another thing with like Daniel, what you were saying with like technology and it, having to do with like mental health, it just made me think that hopefully it can get to the point where technology is so good that we don't have to like consciously use it. Like it just becomes implicit. That would be kind of cool. Um, I'm, I'm sure that's not, you know, original at all, but I, I feel like, uh, like unconsciously what's driving this mental illness is trying to get to the point where it then uh, dissipates and it just becomes uh, like a norm, like meaning like uh, people become aware of the relationship with technology and, and therefore technology involved and how people innovate and technology unfolds in a certain way that it allows people to kind of get around that mental health uh, feature to the use of technology. Um, I think that's like what's actually driving it uh, ultimately. But I, that 
that's that's more or less a side note. Um, I think, uh, Michelle, what you were saying made me think of this idea that I was floating with this like producer a few weeks ago, where it's like imagine a world where everybody isn't operating as like a social creature, but they're operating to like get knowledge. So th what that would entail would be like, oh, like I I'm heterosexual. Like, this is the easiest way to look at it. It's like, oh, I'm heterosexual. Wait, am I? So to be heterosexual, you would have to do everything that's not heterosexual. So everyone's operating in a world where when they wake up in their day, they're trying to, like, discover themselves the truth. So that means always doing the opposite of what they want and identify themselves. So it's, like, sort of like a comedy type of idea. But, um, yeah, it just made me think of that. And then uh, with regard to, like, boredom, I, like I think everything that you guys are saying is so true, and I think about this all the time. Like I've I've read like a few books about boredom. I think like Courage to Be was like a really good book. I think that made me think about boredom in an interesting way. But anyway, I I for me I get bored all the time, and it's like once I catch myself being bored, I'm like, why the fuck am I bored right now? Like what the fuck is going on? And ultimately, what I've learned to like cope with that is I do something for someone else and then I watch like the emotional consequence and like just anticipating like an emotional consequence makes me feel not bored. So like, I think most things are like axiomatic and it's hard to see that when you're not watching the emotional consequence of your actions. Like, being crude like my mom can call and check in on me and be like hey what's going on blah 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 and i and i can and i i could be like oh i was doing this 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 and that and like looking back i was doing this this and that for me but also for like maybe i'm being crude here but to see my mom's reaction and being like oh my god that's so great like that makes me so happy that you are motivated whatever and whatnot um so I think, like, honestly, obviously do things for yourself, but I think for the other, it makes it um, actually fights boredom off because it's boredom is when you really become self-centered in a certain way, I think. Um, but uh, I had a question going in today, but actually, I'll, before, before I get to that question, uh, jo what Jockin was saying uh, had to do with the age-old problem of the many and the one. And for me, I think there's a certain point where it becomes ambivocal. And at that point of ambivo ambivocality, we can't really see beyond that. So I think what, that, what, what I'm essentially saying is that the one is in the many and the many is in the one. And they have this, like, di this dynamic relationship. And like how they can be positioned within each other can be very dynamic and that the one is in the many depending on how and vice versa depending on like the context it's situated in and i understand like why your students would be thinking like oh uh like this fragmented self but they're not seeing this the glue so to speak that's keeping all of that fragmentation together in a certain uh invisible sense because like i do agree on like a crude level on what they're saying. And that's why like I was smiling when you said it because I think it's like almost like a vulgar crude way of looking at it. Um, like a story, like just to tie it to a story, like so many different things are happening. And just to be like, like, oh, this character is just a tow truck driver. Like they can't just be a tow truck driver. That is literally impossible. Like how are you gonna make a story where they're, literally just a tow truck driver like it's it has to be more than just being a tow truck driver like they can be literally behavioral wise and like tangibly see like what you're seeing wise a tow truck driver but the relationship they have to their job or to the, that identity has to also unfold in front of your eyes which is more than just being a tow truck driver in a certain sense um so yeah i mean that I, that's my comment with that and then like one last one last thing and this has to do with the relationship between greatness and goodness and i think we live in a world where people are trying to get to the point of seeing the invisible 
seeing the rep, the repetition, the unconscious, whatever, however you want to call it, docile, doesn't, doesn't matter. And I just keep thinking about what would a world be like if that was actually the baseline instead of the apex? Like if in a world where everybody is on its own, seeing the invisible to a significant degree, like it's good, like how they're seeing it, how would bad be understood? Like something not good. If the baseline is essentially like beauty and goodness. Like I think uh, that's like an interesting uh, thought experiment for me. Um, because for me, like, and I'll, I've been talking for a while, I'll say one last thing, but uh, you can't consciously be great. It's impossible to produce something great or be great intentionally. However, I think you can intentionally produce good things and intentionally be a good person. And I think you stumble upon being great or producing something great in the repetition of being good. And I think that because greatness is, in a certain sense is not in your control, it just pushes the line of what goodness is essentially. So the only thing that you we can do and like study and focus on is basically that line of goodness, knowing that there's this something that could possibly come to get a little Heideggerian that actually changes the uh, horizon line, the baseline of goodness. No, I think that's outstanding. Mr. Rivera, good to see you. So you have that awesome background again. I'm going to give it to Philip here. Yeah, the event, right? Uh, all we can do is clear and then we'll see what comes forth. I think you said a lot of very interesting things. So um, first, I think there is something to be said about um, when technology gets to the point where it's undeniable that we can't keep up with all the emails, it will be a kind of saturation point, like Mr. Ebert says, and we'll no longer feel bad for not. Like right now, there's a problem where it's like technology is not so overwhelming that we all realize we have to get a limiting principle, but it's also possible going to get there where then it's more socially acceptable to have various limiting principles that people have for one another because we understand that it's literally not possible now to keep up with all of the information coming so there may be something there that you can get to the point where the society is more socially accepting of limiting principles or you get a technology that becomes more implicit something you don't have to think about and um so i think it's a very good point um i definitely think there's something to be said about because Mr. Jock was making the point about this passage of time, boredom. There's something about boredom or the passage of time that suggests there is a certain quantity that is necessary for a threshold to be passed. But it's almost like there's a difference between quantity and practice. Like if you're just going through your day, gathering a quantity of boring more moments, as opposed to practicing boredom in a manner where you come to terms with it and examine it, that seems like it can be a good that leads to a great. So maybe there's a difference between the mere collecting of moments or the collecting of boredom and a kind of practice of boredom, which is uh, it's boring to do the dishes, but gosh darn it, I'm going to practice this until I can kind of break through. So there may be some distinction here between a collection and a practice um, that, that speaks to this interesting issue of quantity. Because it does seem to be that you have to collect something, like you have to collect the good but not merely collect, but somehow continually practice something, gather enough to it till you get to the point where the possibility of the event or the great can come through. So there's something that's a, it's a, it's like practice is not mere collecting. It entails collecting, but it's not mere collecting. There's some sort of consciousness about it, some sort of conscious intention. And I guess that's why I keep coming back to this interesting, like the difference between because it does seem society is all about either no energy use or unconscious energy use. Conscious energy use, it does everything in its power to get rid of. Like, I want you to go to work unconsciously and use your energy, or I want you to be unconsciously using your energy in light of technologies that you do, like commodification and different things. Um, but conscious energy use, this seems to be different. And it makes me think uh, there's more to say, but, you know, basically Ivan Illich was kind of like, hey, we don't really pay attention to meta, 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 metabolism as an energy source. And actually, that's one of the key energy sources that can help us decentralize the state. Because what he pointed out is the problem with technology is actually the, the corporation is or business is no longer dependent on meta, met, um, metabolism. 
So then like if it was dependent on metabolism, that actually creates a decentralization effect because I can't just take advantage of everyone or have unrealistic work hours. I have to link it to metabolism and thus take care of people to make sure that they have enough metabolism to work. Ironically, fossil fuels let you transcend the problem of metabolism, but then you're holding people up to standards who are based on metabolism of productivity that's actually based on fossil fuels that isn't bound to the same concrete reality. And so there's something about technological society that naturally ignores metabolism or just the human energy source. You could also talk about libido and different things like that, that what seems to be something about the human being is regaining that in conscious decision making, conscious energy use, which is tied to thinking and action, not mere thinking, seems to be part of that equation. I think also with the truck, there seems to be a difference between knowing that your guy down the street in your common life or suchness is a truck driver and seeing someone on TV as a truck driver. When you know them immediately, the category never comes to eclipse that that's Earl. But when it's on TV, the category eclipses that that is Earl. Which actually, Javier had a lovely piece on Martin Buber and he's talking about Zupancha and, and like, I know Dave has been doing um, Levinas. And there's this interesting tension of the thou that you encounter in your immediacy and the thou that the media uses to manipulate you, right? Like, what do you do when the media is like, hey, you need to vote for us because look at these faces of people that you need to care about. I'm now using the infinity of people to manipulate you. But then what Boober and Le Le and I know Boober and, and Levinas are not the same, but there's this kind of principle of the thou that is bound and found in the immediacy of suchness and the person that is then on the image of the screen that seems to have a different dynamic at play. Now, I'm not saying the person that's mediated through media has no relevance whatsoever, but there seems to be an issue here that means there's a complexity with the same of using categories like truck driver that introduces a complexity. You would naturally not overfit that category when you encounter Earl at the diner, but when you see it on TV, it becomes much easier to overfit that category in problematic ways. So there's an art that is introduced. Um, and I think it is interesting as well because the kind of the conscious energy use, the kind of thinking about what you're doing, the, that's a courage to be, like you mentioned, Tillich. And I would say lastly, like the last thing that Illick said that was so fascinating, the reason why he was so concerned about schooling, and Dave was talking about this, is that schooling turned learning into a commodity. Learning was something that humans naturally did. And then school made it a commodity, something for the workforce. Well, with your story example, like it looks like that's actually how humans are. They naturally are knowledge seeking beings. They naturally are individuals that try to learn, but school then makes that actually a commodity and they lose that habit of energy use. They lose that habit to be in a certain kind of state of learning. And what would the world look like? I'll, I, I, this is a question. I'll, um, what would the look like, world look like if that was the baseline? Um, the bad version of that would be is that you use, I think, your intrinsic motivation and your innate learning to reinforce your pre-existing condition as opposed to cultivate to the reality of diversity. You use it to simply be intrinsically motivated by your beauty, not to open up to the dance of beauties that are found in the thou or the other. So there's something about the many and the one there that has to be thought through. But let me pass it to Philip and then Mr. Jockin. Philip, I hope you are doing well today, sir. Likewise, my friend. Uh libido metabolism and fossil fuels oh my i want to talk about uh like energy anxiety and start with libido i've been reading a lot of reich lately and i like he has a threefold conception of like the mask that you wear in society that has whatever artificial politeness um buys into the customs underneath that is freud's unconscious and then underneath that he calls like the bio physical vegetative life source and I, I think what happens when people are going through freud's unconscious is they get kind of stuck there and they'll say maybe this is all there is and and it it's not like i mean it's a theory right so he he says that you know freud would say it's eros and, and thanatos kind of kind of going back and forth and and Reich says there's something underneath that and then he links it to the difference between inorganic and organic metabolism so like the organic he says it's like we radiate energy from the inside very much like the sun whereas an inorganic uh life form has to go outside of itself and as far as like the energy uh anxiety goes i think what happens a lot of times 
is before we have to do something difficult that might ask more of us than we've ever done before. It's like, I have to go outside of myself to get a ton of energy so that I can make, you know, this new discovery possible uh, instead of like just asking for it. I think that was like kind of the old school way. It was like, Hey, just, I don't know if I'm gonna have enough energy. The worst thing that could happen is I die, but like, please give me enough energy for the next hour to do this thing I've never done before. And that's like sort of where courage and bravery, valor all comes from. Uh, the idea that you have it in you, you don't have to go, um, you know, to the outside. And then, and then it's something about actually letting that energy out because I think a lot of the mental health issues come from that energy, just bouncing around inside of you. And that part of the metabolism, like one of the reasons, uh, at least like physical health, uh, in America is hamstrung by a lot of, uh, metabolic failure within the cells. So there's a lot of people with, uh, non-working metabolism. And I think, uh, what philosophy tries to do is, is tries to look at that kind of like from a thought perspective. It's like, if you have a thought that you can't work through for 10 or 15 years, it's disturbing you. Um, I, I, I find that very interesting. And sometimes people are like, oh, you need to find some words to, to describe what you're feeling. Some people are like, you need to go dance it out. You need to go find some community. Uh, and then one, for one reason or another, you're able to kind of move that through your being. And then like with the fossil fuels, I was just talking to a friend who's working with this company called energy for a common good. And I feel like this is actually, this might be the biggest lever. They're working on nuclear fusion. And they're like, they're, they're super bullish. They're like, we're going to have it in three to five years as far as like outfitting different places in America to contain this new uh, energy source. Um, I don't, I mean, it, it looks like a lot of the wars come from energy uh, plus price. You want to have a certain price on the energy that you're using to maintain the status quo. Um, so you go to places to get that um the east generally has more natural resources and, and energy and we have like financial instruments and technological innovation here in the west um our cell phones take a lot of energy uh and i sometimes wonder like what what would like the balance be so that you can get to a point where the conscious energy is not such a terror is not such a such a vampiric like thing that you're like okay this is like my frame is now this is a problem of prosperity because so many of my systems are operating really really well uh i'm getting to these questions that a lot of people either don't get to or some people get to them right before they die <laughs> those fortunate people and uh you know, how can you then start having conversations with other people when, um, for the most part, they're just like, dude, I would like to think with you. I have no time. I have no energy. I'm sorry. Um, let's sit and watch this Netflix show. Um, and, and that will help us regain the energy or at least like pass some time. Uh, yeah, just a few thoughts. That's magnificent. I'll give to Mr. Jock and Mr. Luber and Mr. Rivera. Now I'm thinking, well, I'll definitely say that I think basically we tend to, I, I really don't like the phrase time management. It's energy management. Because the problem is it's basically because the main commodity by people by which people are paid is hours work. So therefore the main commodity is time. Do you have time? And we don't think about energy. And that's where Dave, time, energy, and different things. I think definitely like because the thing is, if you have the wrong metric for determining what you need, you say, oh, I need time to do. Well, then the way you go about your day would be different than if you said, I need energy to do. Uh, energy seems to be central because it's very, like, I really like what you were saying about like the inner in, um, organic, inorganic plant, humans, energy out to end, something about the psyche creates energy. I mean, I'm now thinking about like, isn't like beauty 
um, and energy. It motivates you. Truth, goodness, they like infinite motivators. There's something about energy in those. Inspiration is an energy. I think about people like Bernard. You know, we would talk about when you uh, you would go sit downtown just to be in the energy to work on your notebooks. Just being in the coffee shop creates a kind of energy. And it's actually interesting that humans seem to have a kind of sense that energy has a kind of centrality. And yet we tend to just talk about time. I need time. But then, of course, as Dave talks about, it could just be garbage time, right? There's a difference between time, energy, and garbage time. But since we don't think about time in terms of energy and energy according to time, uh, then we don't have that category. So it's very interesting to think of a lot of what this kind of gets at is we need to think about life more as a kind of expression of energies. And maybe there's something Deleuzian about this, a little more cybernetic, a little bit more that's kind of looking at libido as a kind of energy. And I think there is some, I, I actually think there's a massive conversation to be had between the dialectical materialism and the new materialism. I have a lot to say on that, but that's the perennial uh, Deleuze, Hegel debate, Lacan debate, which if we enter into the net will crash. So we won't do that. But there's something that they, it's interesting to me to think like, Beauty energizes. Like there's something about the infinites that have a kind of energy to them, right? And likewise, if a story has a theme, like there's an energy to the story. Otherwise, it gets boring and it kind of dies out. And it's interesting to think about all these things have something to do with energy, inspiration, motivation, atmosphere. What does a relationship do? There's a kind of energy gained in relationships. So I think it, what's being pointed at is we have not thought enough, socially at least, about the centrality of energy in a lot of these different things. And what does virtue do? It energizes you because your mind isn't being wasted thinking about all the vice and sin you did that you're keeping quiet, right? Like there's something about virtue that energizes. There's something about after the gym, like if you work out, you have more what? Energy, right? So it's interesting to think. But let me get to Mr. Jock and Mr. Luber and then Mr. Rivera. Mr. Jock and please. And excellent points, Daniel and crew. Always a pleasure being here. I, I posted up on the on Twitter about optimize your life for places of of discourse, right? That first thoughts. And as I said, the net is definitely one of those places. And I think this conversation is one example of that. So what was just said by Philip, Daniel, and Luber about psychological energy? I remember, Dan, Luber, you said that comment about self-centeredness being a kind of operation of boredom and of ignorance, right? It's literally a self-closing. So like what Philip said, a kind of energy management and a vampiric dynamic, part of the problem, what causes the pain and boredom is a kind of blocking off from the external world of a kind of self-image or a self-centeredness and orientation. And as you said, when, when, the, when the immediate way, actually, I remember reading this in research, one of the best ways to get yourself out of funks like that is do service and charity to others. So your note, Uber, about kind of emotional consequence of doing actions, it's I think that's a very reasonable point uh, being made. We kind of need these moments to strike through, kind of through the veil right, of the self. Um, you also made a comment about the you know, ambivocal, right, the many and the one. I forgot who said it, but someone, I think 20th century writer, history is just one damn thing after another. It's kind of pointing out the country, the challenge of it, that uh, in the sense that one way you can read history is not having these meta narratives, these larger thematic structures, and just say it's just a one damn thing after another. I'm just one relation, one persona. Remember, persona means mask originally. The original meaning of the word persona is mask. Uh, so I'm one mask in one dynamic, I'm another mask in another dynamic. So I totally agree with you that the tension point is to say, well, yeah, that fractional, if you break off the fractional, just like slow to explode in a thousand directions, there is no unity to hold it together. Uh, and that's very, quite frankly, schizophrenic. Uh, it's a very unhealthy mental state. There's no sense of self-ownership. That's what I'm getting at. Like, that's kind of the, because one way you can, the container basically becomes either the organization, right? The social mores, the bureaucratic structure, or it can be a moral code that, as a human being, as a Christian, as a Muslim of the Ummah, right? We have these boundedness communities that, yes, I'm relating to you as my barber, but you're also of my community and some other container, right? Those could, I think it's a really interesting like tension point right there. Because um, I think that's why I just want to kind of sit, have that float there for a second. But by the way, also, Luber, your comments about that greatness versus goodness question, immediately, Aristotle, ethics, excellence is not is not an act, it's a habit. So clearly he's pointing out that there's some kind of habitual, as you said, habituation over time that makes it a habit. So a habit's a non-thought, it's a de-thought 
act activity that you just do because this is what you are. So it's always very fun, right? Because one of the questions is what makes a person a good person? The biggest difference from Kant, the Kantian model of that versus Aristotelian is for Aristotelian models. And based on that, the good should be effortless. It's literally you're fluent in it. You are fluent in the good. You just do it. Literally, the Nike thing, just do it. There's no, there is no strife. There is no struggle. It is pure flow and fluency. This is where my and these kind of notions of beauty, when we're talking about this, come from that direction. It's quite ugly and slave-like to be struggling and striving and kind of like, it's, it's a, that's a very Kantian model, that the good comes from the person who, who struggles to do it. That's a very split of point of view um, or distinction. Another note, by the way, is also, listen, on this discussion of work, I mean, the, risk, the, the classical view, there's a difference between slaves and the noble and the free. That's a huge difference. We are we are not in that world. Like we, I think we are just in very different modes. One because we have such ins- like people in the West have such insane labor time, like leisure time. Like I was in the market of a free man was his leisure. We have abundance of it. That's not the problem. The problem now is basically we've given people all access to all this leisure. The distinction becomes what do you do with that leisure? What is the opportunity cost? What are you spending your that time on? As we discussed, are you num- are you self medicating through Netflix, right? Or is it through intellectual activity or physical activity, whatever, things like that? Um, you know, I sit on that. Also, I think another angle is the idea of financial instruments. Like, I think we absolutely have a, have a class system based on access to infrastructure, meaning like these are a Marxian, the kind of Marx mode means of production. But I don't mean literally factories and shit. I mean, op- basically apparatuses that generate revenue, basically due to the income streams. Now, in the digital era, that gets you can play games with that. You don't have to have physical assets for that anymore, uh, necessarily. But the basic op- there is definitely a class distinction of those who are which tax pro- which tax forms are you filling in. You got the those W twos, ten ninety nines. You want to know a class difference? That's right there, just straight up. Like as, uh, but basically the question becomes who gets it. And actually, what's interesting on that point, just to meditate on that, a W two employee gets dictated where when and how do the job, their activity. They get dictated all these things. 1099 employees, none of those things are dictated. They cannot by definition be dictated uh, to do those things. They're only responsible for the outcome, for the output. The means, process, and when is completely at the freedom of that, t- that 1099 form employee, the independent contractor. Uh, so I think that's a very fascinating point that in that sense, there is a clear class distinction right there on which line, which line in the sand sits there. There are obviously exceptions. I think faculty and teachers are clearly one, of, like in the university level. I don't, not true at all at the fucking, at the high school level or below. Absolutely not. My high school friends, the ones who teach at high school and blower, nope, they are 100% W2 employees. The way their education, their method of teaching is completely structured and dictated is very slave-like. Uh, they do not have freedom in their choice of capacity. Professors do, people in college level do. So there are some nuances I'll admit in this distinction, but I wanna point out that they do exist and they're not the same as the classical distinctions of how, of the free man versus the noble, right? The noble and the slave, but they're definitely there. And I don't think we like talking about it, but I think that absolutely is in play uh, just under the surface. But that note about, on our last note, on this idea of excellence as a habit, not an act, um, and this kind of distinction of the effortless fluency of doing it, there's, I've been, re, I've been talking, researching on training, akesis, and what gets, what gets translated as devotion, uh, epistemesis. Um, it's very fascinating because in Phaedrus, there's a lot of discussion about this in Plato, talking about the doctor of the soul, the, the, the special doctor of the soul, the rhetorician, who presents figures to the soul to persuade them to cultivate to virtue and excellence via their training and devotion. So there's both like, there's this very interesting language being used to talk about a kind of, not just kind of um, external objects to manipulate, but also a kind of, you have to have a certain soul to emanate by paradigm, by example, uh, for the other souls to be motivated to change, to cultivate moving, to be persuaded to move towards virtue and excellence. Um, Because I just bring that up because the idea of like, where does the energy to get inspired come from? Absolutely. I mean, I remember this when I was younger in my early 20s. Like, I absolutely looked at, like, E.T., um, E.T., the, the hip-hop preacher. 
for example. Like, it's a little embarrassing to admit that, but I absolutely did. Like, these kind of inspirational, uh, quasi-hustle culture, yeah, we can make these arguments about that. Uh, or literally the, oh, God, I forgot who. Um, the just-do-it guy. Uh, he was in, in Transformers. I forgot his name. Oh, Shayla Buff. There you go. Um, these, um, these are paradigm examples. They're literally, I mean, they're quasi-memes. Yes, exactly. They're, I mean, they're memes. And this is a meme parodies, basically. You can make fun of it. Uh, but they definitely draw an image in the mind. And I remember when I would be tired and exhausted and when I get up early, I would use those, I would use those images to draw inspiration, to kind of gather that energy to go do it, just do it, <laughs> uh, to do the activities that were hard, that were difficult at the time. And eventually through repetition, those things that were once difficult become effortless and easy. Like, of course I get, I get of course I get up at 5 a.m. and go run, what of it? Of course, I'm going to read this Aristotle. Of course, I'm going to translate this in the Greek. Of course, I'm going to do this. Of course, I'm going to do that. Um, so I'm just kind of meditating and sitting on these points because there's something really nuanced about the kind of en gathering of energy and, and persuasion of the soul that requires practitioners to kind of move us. Uh, that kind of strike that has that striking quality that pierce against the self that we're not just entrapment. It's almost like the hell of the world is being trapped in yourself in a weird way to meditate on that. And the, the, an idea of what makes a person free in the first place. That's all I got. Excellent. I'll get to Mr. Luber and Mr. Rivera. Now I'm thinking, so a few things. First off, I meant to mention, I think there's also something about ideology or like conspiracy or cult that is energy saving because it's a complete system. So you don't have to think about it anymore. But what's very interesting is that all of these examples of ways that people find a kind of completeness category, um, you know, INTP, Myers-Briggs, whatever, there's a completeness, there's a kind of label. What's so interesting is it's almost like we, we're moved toward, we're moved toward, let me say, not completion, I want to use the word conclusion. We, 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 we move toward these conclusions so we don't have to think. But in that conclusion, which we do to avoid thinking or to save energy, we therefore lose energy. It's almost like energy is a thing that you, is like building muscles that you tear them and it comes down. What we need is not conclusions, but we as human beings look for conclusion. What is my job? What is this relationship? Like to put a container around it, ideology, whatever. What we really need is completion, which is the distinction between conclude and complete that I was speaking with Matthew Allison about. Completion is found in the working toward excellence, working toward like an open system where there's energy consciously going out that actually then in increases the capacity for energy to be, be, be produced by the subject, psychic energy of the community. Just like working a muscle then makes you have more strength within inside of you to use on the external world. It might be something like that with energy, where if we have to avoid these temptations for a conclusion, a, a closed container for our energy, which we close because, you know, we don't want to lose the energy, which then is actually why we lose it. Because it's like we're saving money in the bank, but we're never investing. So the inflation kills us or something like that. Um, and now I'm thinking, I think everything should have, it's very interesting because it's almost like the only way to get time energy, which is this quality energy infused time is in a state of excellence, which is a result of being able to do conscious energy use as a habit. But it's almost like the problem with society today is there, there is like no social mechanisms to get people to that place of excellence as habit. So what ends up happening is you go to work and it's all kind of scattered and fragmented. And then you get like TV on the weekend. You don't have to go like do uh, hay bales, you know, lifting square bales. But then because you're never, it's so fragmented that you're never brought to a place of excellence. You never actually get time energy for all the time off you get. It's not energy that then can be infused with say philosophy or relationships or taking on the real. And maybe that's part of the structural element because like when I think about the difference between blue collar and white collar, when I worked at the wholesale, you know, once we filled the cooler up with boxes, there was nothing the boss could do. Like the truck is empty. They can't force you to do more work because of the literal facticity of the building. But with an email, you can always answer another email. It is not limited by the facticity. So I have friends, you know, friends who do like more investment banking or white collar and different things. They don't actually have the kind of grace of the facticity to put a limit on their work because they could answer an email at two in the morning. They could take another call. Whereas there's a point where I literally can't fill the cooler anymore with boxes because of facticity. So it's interesting because as you move to white collar, 
you move out of as much manual labor, but in moving out of manual labor, you, um, you lose the limiting principle of the facticity itself. In the same way that moving toward technology removes you from the limiting principle of the meta meta metabolism itself. And what that does is you get this weird mixture of less manual labor for many people, but then no road to excellence to then get a habit of conscious energy use that then creates this optimal human state that Dave calls time energy or excellence or beauty or virtue. So it's that weird mixture of you have technology that means you don't have to do as manual labor, but you also don't have a limiting principle to save your psychic energy. And there's no clear way to get to a habit of excellence. So then you can be this self-turning wheel or this character of virtue. So it's this weird mixture of all these different factors that seem to be coming together. But let me pass it to Mr. Luber and then Javier Rivera. Mr. Luber. My God, so much. Um, and uh, Michelle, I applaud you for listening and cooking all at the same time. I mean, talk about multitasking. Um, yeah, again, a lot of good things said. Um, I guess uh, it's, it's funny. I actually recently just read Phaedrus, uh, played as his Phaedrus, and uh, it, basically a big, t like, just to kind of piggyback on what you were saying, Thomas, um, like, I kind of just, the big takeaway is, like, love the tautology, like, I love to love, you know, like I like, and it's true. Like I love stories. I just love stories like that. It's just, you can't really say more than just the tautology in, in a certain sense when you get to that certain point. And I think um, that relates to, we were talking about like, like practice, I think earlier, um, just how a practice becomes a practice when a certain quality reveals itself. So like, I think you, the revealing of itself is the moment in which the tautology occurs. So it's, 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 I love stories because a good story, like a story like appeared to me and it's like, oh my God, I just love that. Whatever that, whatever that thing is, I just, I just love it. Um, so I think like inspiration for me at least just comes from a from a lack of understanding the tautology. It's like I have experienced the tautology, but I can't actually like understand it, express it. And that's like why the work, the unfolding needs to happen, because you want to express this thing that just revealed itself and just almost washed over you. And that almost has like its own, it has its own like bubble where you just want to like, not necessarily pop it, but you want to like feel around it and show other people that there's this, there's this bubble. And like, it, it's a very tough line to walk because you can easily pop the bubble. It's very fragile. Like you can even lose it yourself, like in the unfolding of whatever practice you're doing. Like you can, like, I forget what story it is. Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the, it's like the classic, like, oh, I've been a police officer for 40 years. And like, what the reasons why I became a police officer 40 years ago were a and like now I just realized like I'm not operating under those reasons at all like I popped the bubble I popped the 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 beauty of why I'm practicing what I'm practicing so there's like a certain like forgetting that is very possible when you're like in the unfolding um and I and I think just holding on to the tautology and it just basically like it repeating itself and allowing it to repeat itself, even though the context, the situation changes, like allowing it to happen and having faith that it's compatible and that it will work out for what's good for you. Um, and I think what happens is there's a situation that emerges and then you're just like, you almost forget why you were, what brought you to that situation in the first place. Because the situation is like, 
so destructive to your initial motivation. And it's very easy and clear to see in like a love dynamic. That's the easiest practice in a certain sense to see it because it's like, like, I can go so many ways, but like you are operating in a certain way and then you meet someone and that you fall in love with. And it's just like, you forget how you were operating. So at that moment, you could betray yourself so easily. Like you were so vulnerable to just like, oh, like I'm so infatuated by this person. I'm just going to forget certain like, ver like certain things that are good for me. Like, oh, instead of going to bed early, like I normally do because I have to get up early and X, Y, and Z, I'm going to stay up late as hell and talk to this person until I fall asleep. You know, you're, you're going to forget certain things that make you, you. And, the, and the same way, the same thing with the other way around where like, you forget how to love because you were part of something that made you forget that you love, like how you love, like you're, you're done a relationship and you're like, fuck, I don't even know how to be single. Like the, the classic, you know, shtick. Um, so I think it's just like really holding on to the tautology uh, was, was, is something that I was thinking. And then a few more things. Um, I love the um, completion versus conclusion. And just like a quick side note, it made me just think about adding that sentiment to a certain part of the book where like, cause we've talked about it where it was just like, like at the end of the story, basically when the theme completes itself, bounce and you bounce still continues it, like the ba it, the story bounces on and you're still there's a certain anticipation in a certain sense like you approach a conversation post story at that moment and in the approach of that conversation you are anticipating something to change about how you viewed that story and like that's because there's a certain level of not knowing the fullness of the story and the need to have the conversation to talk about it with the other person. Um, so I just wanted to say that side note. And then, um, yeah, I think two more things like, uh, ultimately, like, I'm just hung up on what you were saying with your students, Jack, and honestly, I'm still a little hung up. Like, they're, like, it always, there always is a self. There always is this one because ultimately whatever ideology or things that you spew out or behave or whatever it comes out of you like these multiplicities at the end of the day still get boiled down to this univocal being and you're still doing something like i am talking to you guys instead of like eating lunch like i can't be lunch andrew and talk to the net andrew like Ultimately, you can conceptualize yourself as these different people. But like, at the end of the day, all these, you know, multiplicities have to be boiled down into one thing in that moment um, that you're focused on. I mean, that's why it's like really impressive to multitask. Like, not everyone can multitask for that reason. Bring it back to Michelle and cooking. Like, you have to, there's a certain level that's required for that. Um, so I, so yeah. And then, um, one more thing about greatness. Um, like, I think for me, like just to piggyback on everything we were just saying with that is just, it's it, greatness is a gift. Ultimately, like when something great happens, it always is like a surprise. It's always like a shock. It's always, um, it's a, and it's funny because it's ironic because it always comes out of you giving something good, you putting something on the table. So it's like you think that you're the arbitrator of it all. But ultimately, you by putting something on the table, something other comes and overtakes it completely that you begin to operate according to that or you whatever. You, you are now aligned with that instead of what you put on the table. And it always starts with you putting it on the table and then something bouncing back that's not quite you. It then becomes you, but it doesn't start from you in a certain sense. It starts from you putting it on the table, but it, you putting it on the table after that, it's like hands are off. Like whatever happens at this point, 
whatever like when i when i uh write a story and then i'm giving it to like my boy steven for notes like this story can change like i am putting it on the table i believe it's a good story and it becomes greater via not me but it's still my story so it's a really weird space so, like whose story is it like I, i've been thinking a lot about that whose stories am i telling because ultimately i'm telling like I'm writing a story and I'm just mimicking the motivations that make me want to be a storyteller in the first place in every story that I'm telling. And they just manifest and express differently. But what motivates me is clear. But who's like the question of who, whose stories are these when someone else can give notes and they can see the theme of my story. And then all of a sudden the story dramatically changes from what I wrote and that's not because of me, but it is because of me. So it's, it is and isn't. Who, whose story is it? Is it Steven's story? Fuck no. I wrote it. But yet it wouldn't be what it is without him. So it, it, it's, same thing with the book. You know, it's like, I, you know, I can't even separate my own notion. Like once I became introduced to the notion of the truth isn't the rational in your language and the stuff that you publish and stuff online, it's like, I thought I thought that way, but then I guess I didn't in a certain sense. It's like a really weird space because it's definitely your work. But then it's like, wait, that influenced my work so much. It's like similar, but it's like, whose is this? Who's, who's or what? Because in my mind, like theme easily could be like the book easily could just be written by Daniel Garner. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it doesn't have to be my names on it in a certain sense because f- there's a certain feeling like it's mine and it isn't. <laughs> it's so weird. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud, but uh, yeah, I'll pass it. No, I think you're asking tremendous questions. And first off, you're very kind. And second, uh, definitely the book exists because of you and Alex. Uh, There's no doubt about that. Uh, I'll pass it to Javier and Philip. What is interesting is I think even with the uh, example with Mr. Jonkin, it's the problem of talking in terms of things and points in a geometrical and situation world. Like the book is a result of a situation. Uh, and there is a situation. And in reality, there are only situations, ergo relations. Likewise, when we talk about Mr. Jock and the, the many and the one, there is a teacher is a word that by definition requires a situation of students, right? So the word teacher, the many, the one is always of the many. It's not one and many. It's like one of many because we live in a geometrical w- world. And I think that's because everything is situational. And you see, the issue is in situation, we can have completeness. And the problem is if we're algebraic, we ended up in conclusion, energy gone, auto cannibalism, and we lose everything. And so there's really an issue where we as human beings have to engage in practices to make sure we stay more relational and situational so that we can actually have energy that is being used in a proper way and not get lost in point thinking that then closes us. And as we close, we enter a mode of conclusion that concludes us in self-effacement. So there seems to be something where it's the issue of all situations are made of things, and yet things don't exist independent of situations. That's crazy, but that's what we're trying to think when we ask whose book is this, whose class is this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to to pass it to Javier and then Philip, there is something, oh, and I want to note, it's almost like until you have that glimmer you described, it's not possible for you to practice only to collect. You know, we were saying earlier about the collection of moments of boredom versus the practicing of moments of boredom. It's as if you need glimmers to be able to have a difference between a mere passage of time and a building of time. So then you need to organize your life and your relationship so that there are glimmers in them, like you described, the glimmer of theme, the glimmer of beauty, so that then the relationship with your spouse or friends can move in the direction of practicing not just collecting, the practicing of the relationship as opposed to the mere collecting of the moments of the relationship, which is the mode of situation in which the human being is then able to cultivate energy as opposed to just lose energy, thus move into habits of excellence in that state of excellence, which becomes a habit of conscious energy use, conscious thinking, but in a manner that you've become excellent in. So instead of it draining you, it becomes like going to the gym to use your muddles and it becomes refining and building and growing. There's more to say, but let me pass it to Mr. Javier Rivera and then Philip, Mr. Rivera, it's good to see you today, sir. Yeah, it's good to see you guys. Oh man, there's a lot. Um, So I think we can think about this in several ways. I have a problem. I mean, like, 
it's hard for me to play with the language energy and everything, but um, I'm going to try my, the best way that I can. Um, recently, um, in some of my classes, we've been talking about some theories of religion, Fraser and Tyler come to mind about this idea of between magic and religion. And the thesis was, uh, in some sense that when it comes to religion and magic, well, specifically religion, um, that you had to preserve the divine force and in order to uh, preserve the divine force or in, in the language that we're using in order to preserve energy, you needed to scapegoat or sacrifice something, a substitution, right? Um, typically, uh, it was, it should have been the, what they call the magician king or the, the priest king, but, um, sometimes they would substitute that um it would be the animal or the their son the son would be uh the pretend king etc etc right an effort to preserve the energy now and what we're talking about in terms of habits and everything uh i think the question is what is that what is that sacrifice what is that substitution that is needed to preserve the energy in order for us to maintain it, to keep it going. Um, in, in some sense, uh, the, the culture of productivity um, is not occupied with, <laughs> it, it, is not, it do doesn't care about your energy at all, really. Um, even though leisure time, putting aside leisure time or having leisure time itself is a product of that cycle, right? I mean, the fact that companies want you to give you time off so you can recuperate and just become better workers, right? Like it, it's not really a, um, a, as leisurely as, as we would say, it's still an effort to become a better worker. Um, so in some sense, it's not really preserving energy. It's only maintaining energy in a certain direction. And what does that do to us when we are maintaining energy in a certain direction? Um, now, unfortunately, with our digital machine age, um, the, the myth of the whole uh, magician king and the priest king was that, you know, you, you would see the decadence happening. And so you would have to do a sacrifice or a substitute. The problem with the technology age and everything else is that we don't really, it's hard to see that decadence. It's really hard to see that decadence in real time. Digital technology doesn't seem itself to reveal a decadence, a, a real tangible decadence, um, because it's more of a, it's more of a machine. You don't see a machine um, break down as, as vividly as somebody growing old, um, especially if we're talking about like digital media and stuff. Um, it, it's harder to see that. So I, I feel like we're, we're at tensions with, I think we have pro po possibly we have another obstacle, which is not only do we have this problem of uh, turning, of how do we position ourselves to preserve energy and, and put energy towards relations, right? But it's the fact that it's been obscured itself. That possibility has been obscured from us, which is precisely what Buber kind of um, <laughs> hesitated, like he, he was melancholic about because this I-it relationship, this relationship between objects and I would say boredom fundamentally in the most brutal way is when you become an object to yourself. Um, cogwheel in time, you're just a machine, whatever. Like this is also Marx critique, right? Alienation from your labor, everything. I, I mean, Marx is talking about a real relation and so is Buber. But how do we cultivate that now um, when everybody else is um, in some sense has a a kind of, misconception about what it means to have a real relation <laughs> uh and i feel like that's what's been obscured and, and that's the problem i have with um even trying to it's a real difficult problem i, I don't have the answer for how how that would happen but the only thing i have an answer for is that it, it requires a positionality and it requires a letting go and a clearing uh for immediacy surprise and how do we cultivate that when how do we cultivate that without that itself becoming a, a kind of method, right? Um, and, and that's where real relations happen, I, I would say. 
Um, and, and yeah, that's it. That's all I got to say. That's excellent. And I think it kind of speaks to the necessity of incorporating the other because the only way it's almost like the other is the opening, but it's also complete. This is because I know language and don't worry, we're not, we're not uh language Nazis, you know, like there's grammar Nazis. We're not language Nazis. Uh, so no worries. Uh, you know, a lot of philosophers like to spend three hours as, uh, as language Nazis. We don't do that here. We do our best. And I, I think, um, there's something very interesting because relationships, can be can are the we they're complete. So to use the language I was using is they're complete, but but a relationship that's an I it is concluded. They're concluded. They're dead. But because you know Ebert was saying in the last lax we were talking about this weird tension of it's like well there's an incompleteness but then in that completeness there's a completeness in that incompleteness and it's like it it's becoming but it's also not just chaos. So there's this weird situation that is complete and in its completeness is changing and open. It it does seem that the only way to have an open system is with the other. And that would mean the only way to have this self-creating energy is in relationship. And that seems to be the case. Like if we think of the thou as the, um, so it's like the I, it is concluding, self-effacing would be other language because we're now adding as much language as possible. Whereas the I thou is complete in this, and it's complete in the way that use, going to the gym to use weights is complete. You're complete because you're doing the task of why you're at the gym to lift weights, but it's precisely to break down your muscles so that they get just stronger. So it's almost like you want to say in a relationship, you are completing the function of the human maybe, and it's a weird act of breaking down the ego so that it can come back as a subject, maybe. Like there's a breaking down of the self so the self comes back stronger but less egotistical. In the same way you're complete in the gym, breaking down your muscles, which is the act of making them stronger. And it seems, and all of that then is a movement to a state of excellence if you do this enough because you've seen a glimmer of this in the relationship. Now you can move to practice versus collecting. And now you can practice this to the point where you get excellent at it. And then this energy, this uh, time energy, as Dave puts it, this spirit, I think is another fair word for it, then becomes constitutive of your regular day. So you gradually move to a permanency. You follow Dante, you followed Beatrice gradually to a place where it then is the regular habit of your day, but it was through a process that is only possible in relation. The last thing I'll say is you brought up religion. It definitely seems as if energy, well, the word for spirit following uh, Multimon in the crucified God or the crucified, the spirit is like, you know, the word spirit is like Rahai, R-A-H-I, I think, which means wind, which means spirit is animating principle. It is the animating principle of reality. You know, it's what makes you alive. Oh, they have spirit. So spirit and energy are really tied together. And then if we talk about religion is interested in spirit, well, then it's interested in energy. And all of what we're talking about in terms of some sort of cultivation of energy has something to do with religion. Then time energy has something to do with religion. Garbage time. Like the use of energy and time then all get kind of tied together into these questions. And I definitely think if we're not thinking of kind of hard dualistic religion of getting out of the world, then the language of spirit has something to do with animation. And if we're talking about animation, we're talking about something with a kind of energy. And it's very interesting that there's a sacrifice. And it would seem to be that the sacrifice has something to do with the encounter of the other because you're sacrificing your ability to know what's going to happen because the other is always surprising. So the sacrifice is the, I can't plan now. <laughs> you know, if you're genuinely open to the other, you can prepare, but you can't plan. But that's precisely why now you have the possibility of an open system where the energy can be cultivated in a better and more human way. But let me give it to Philip here. Philip. Yeah, and a lot of this mimics the breath and how it's one of the first things when we come into this world, we recognize we, we, uh, we don't have enough inside of us. Uh, so we have to breathe. And that's kind of the first, um, we recognize we're not, we have a whole, we are not whole, uh, but we're a part of this like greater thing. And I think it's, you know, especially pertinent to our times where, where you have the thing with George Floyd, we, I, I do have a vague feeling that we, 
are under behavioral dictates from mummified bureaucrats that are seeking to uh, basically make us hold our breath, make us feel uh, as if in order to make it in the system, we we have to, um, you know, Freud's anal drive and money is is like often together, you know, and they'll call someone a tight ass, not only someone who who isn't taking deep breaths, but also someone who's um, tight with the money and and you know, I'm leaning more and more into this idea of how you do one thing might be how you do everything. And, uh, you know, how to go, you know, look at this question of like, you know, an ENFP on a level of personality, maybe like the, like the broad brushstrokes, like breakdown of, uh, some popular self-help would be like uh, uh, Kobe's seven habits of effective people where he says, you know, to move from a personality to like a character uh, um, ethic. And I think like it's one of, I don't know, it's so hard to say anything like prescriptive because I, I, I have never found anything with the question, who am I? That has done nothing except drain my energy because all I'm doing, I, I feel like I just create images upon images upon images upon images that just fall apart. Um, but for some reason, a lot of people that seems to work great. Uh, and then asking, I, I find a lot of just like, what I am, what am I? Uh, and I think on some level, like when you're talking about the glimmering, how can you you know, keep a certain glimmer in your eye so that when you see another person, you're able to recognize them um, as more than your images of them. So you're seeing the person, you're seeing the, uh, you know, what they are, the molecules of carbon, right, that together are more than uh, the parts. And to have that radiate out into the society uh your I, I i think no one there, there's been a bunch of attempts and it maybe it has happened in like small things that just got like erased from history but uh it it does seem as far as like structuring the narrative it seems like in opposition to all that gleaming there are these few people with tons of power that have been upregulated that have this dark triad so it's like this gleaming versus like this dark triad you get into to like some interesting questions of just like what you know am i and um those are two i find just interesting energies uh that may be dormant in a lot of people and I wonder, I wonder sometimes like the use of well-roundedness. Like, because someone will be like, "Oh yeah, if you're if you're very energetic, you can become well-rounded." I'm not sure how much like the market uh, like uh, recognizes this. Um, I sometimes feel like that's a lot what my mom said, and then my dad would be like, "No, just get really good at one thing," and that's that's kind of how you're gonna gonna take care of um you know your purpose and 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 all this good stuff uh so i wonder sometimes like are there certain people who their energy will go into a life that is a dancer speaks multiple languages uh sort of like with joseph piper like knows what to do with their leisure time right and can have kind of like a proliferation into many different hobbies uh and then there are uh, maybe people more like the functionary type um, that are just like, no, I, I am an accountant. And I could see how that's not like a story other people would want to tune into given the like story environment we watch now. But as far as, you know, that body living that, um, I can, I can see the appeal because opening up is, 
very scary. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. That's excellent. I will give it to Mr. Javier Rivera. Well, well rounded makes you one of the characters in Wally, -E, where you're in a chair floating around. You're very well rounded. Um, well rounded is a very problematic notion. So a few things by it, if we mean vast exposure to many things, and then from that exposure, you choose one to commit to and sacrifice to by all means. And I think when people say you need to be well rounded, that's kind of what they're getting at. Um, also, too, it's funny, a lot of times when they talk about being well-rounded, they don't mean be good at emotion, socializing, art, manual labor, and different things. They mean no English, history. It's used as a no multiple genres within a field. So you're actually not well-rounded. You are, you, you're well-rounded like a flat circle. You're like a cartoon character. So very rarely do people use well-rounded to mean become a full human being. It's usually used to justify the first year in college being a waste of money uh, because you have to take all of these general requirements. So it's nonsense. Now, again, you need to be exposed, which is a courage thing because it takes a lot of courage to expose to many things. But the problem is if you are well-roundedness or experientialism, I'm doing many things. If you are using it to avoid a commitment, if you are using it to rationalize fear, there's a big problem. There's a diff big difference between saying I'm an accountant as a shield from the other and I am an accountant to specify a commitment. If it's a commitment, that's a very virtuous thing. But that's usually not what people mean, unfortunately. Like if I'm saying I'm, I'm an accountant who believes in philosophy, if I'm doing it like it's like I'm telling you where I stand so that you can better relate to me. That's perfectly fine and has a lot of value. But if I'm saying I'm an accountant, so don't bother me, that's very different. So there's a difference between using designation as a shield versus designation as a commitment that then from that commitment, I can undergo transformation in sight of the other. So there's a difference between an openness from a place of commitment and an openness that avoids commitment. There's a difference between an open mind to enable empathy and an open mind so I can avoid thinking. Because what's a truly open mind, as Mr. Bertrand Russell put it? A mind with nothing in it. So there are different forms of openness. There's an openness from commitment and exposure and risk and the willingness to face fear. And there's an openness that is an avoidance. And only you can know the difference. But they're, ve they're very, very big difference. And unfortunately, language is used to mean different things at different times. And I think it speaks to Mr. Luber's point you know, High Root once said, you know, and this is based on the negation where Mr. Luber was saying there's a kind of commitment, there's a kind of designation, and you repeat that day by day. So, you know, High Root's example is, you know, there are rock climbers and there are rock climbers. We all heard that difference, right? And yet they're, they're the same and yet they're not the same. That's how a commitment functions, where you say, I'm a rock climber, but then it's like, I'm a rock climber to be a rock climber. Same designation, carry through time, commitment, so you can get really good at it, but it's also changing in that commitment. Transformation with commitment. I think this is only possible in relation. Because how else can you change without changing from a commitment other than standing still but, but letting new relations enter into you that you can never predict? It does seem like the only way to have this dynamic where you find the one in the many, if you will, where you find an open commitment is in the context of a, of a relationship because a relationship is unpredictable. You can't reduce it and it requires courage to face. It requires and the courage has this transformative element. So it would seem as if the only way to arrive at this this energy building system that we were talking about, it has something to do with a certain openness. I'll also know you were talking about a dark triad. I was speaking with Christian the other day. He was saying, you know, you have truth, beauty, and goodness. It's almost like you have uncertainty, death, and isolation. And those are the like negative infinities that are all fear-based. And so basically, and they're all a result of fear, basically. So that would mean the way to avoid the negative inf infinities has a lot to do with facing fear and taking a commitment requires facing fear and being open to the other requires facing fear. And I think if you put those two together, we start seeing how you can have an open system that entails a wheel turning its own wheel. But let me give it to Javier Rivera and then Mr. Thomas Jock. And I have about 15 minutes late left before needing to run to the grocery store. But let me give it to Mr. Rivera and then Mr. Jock and Mr. Rivera. Uh, this is good. I mean, 
I think the the negative triad that you're talking about um, is uh, what is also funny enough. That's what keeps us in a kind of spurious negativity, and ironically, what keeps us as a just a cog cogwheel in a machine, right? It's a productivity to its max. Um, there is a cutoff, though, um, and that cutoff, though, is when we don't entertain that spurious negativity. We cut off the spurious negativity in attempt to give a genuine response. Um, Buber tells this, you know, nice tale about, you know, a, a rabbi being questioned by another man, and the man says, you know, isn't it kind of a contradiction that God asks Adam where he is? Um, and Buber notes that the rabbi, you know, most people would typically respond with an impersonal response, meaning like, oh, it doesn't actually contradict because God is such and such and such and such, right? But um, the rabbi decides to give a personal question back from an um, impersonal question itself. And he says, actually, Adam is very similar to you or to us in the sense of he's asking, where are you now? Where are you now in your life? Um, and that's it. But if you went a step further, like, oh, where have I gone? Where have I been? Um, and then you start seeing the futility of that. Um, that's when that question itself becomes a spurious negativity. Um, you start seeing the futility. Um, I like I like this notion of commitment. And I think that's probably also why self-help books kind of fail, um, because people think that... Um, the self-help is going to guarantee some type of um, change. It doesn't guarantee a change. Um, but I think uh, Davout did a review about self-help books, actually, that I found very helpful. There's another way to have a relation with self-help books in, in terms of it can be a kind of uh, a turning point for you in terms of it can cultivate a genuine response from you. It doesn't mean that it will work. It doesn't mean that it will happen. It doesn't mean that change is guaranteed. But what's interesting about relations um, is that relations typically inspire change most of the time. It's very hard to do a self-motivated, um, self-help book change. Like, I think once you start doing that, it's a very quick, you're like one symptom away from going, what's the point-ism? <laughs> you know, you're like very, you're like very close to getting to that point of like, what's the point-ism? Because um, until you have a, a, a response to give that is to the other and, and not just your own, to yourself, um, you quickly fall into a spurious negativity. I mean, it's, it's like so easy. Um, and so I think a lot of people are afraid of giving a genuine response because it's unpredictable. It's, uh, you, you can't give a prescription to a response. Uh, the, well, at least what the other is demanding, you can't give a response to. Uh, gonna wait. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it, it, it is about cultivating, um, how do I generally respond to something? And I think that's the question that some people are missing in their lives. Um, and this is actually, this is a question of creativity. This is a question of art. This is a question of story. Like this is everything. How do I genuinely respond to something? Uh, it's, it's all about, it's about narrative. I mean, that's why it's so fun doing um, spontaneous comedy um, and surprise. It's, it's about how do I give a general response to something without prescription? Um, the thing is that you see now is that we're really scared and being a well-rounded individual, to use that term, is a way to avoid a genuine response in some sense, right? You, you, you want to be a well-rounded individual so that way you have no weaknesses, right? Um, you're afraid to, to give a response to your, for yourself um, and, and to, to reveal a weakness. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. I like that idea that well-rounded is a way to avoid weakness. That's good. I'll give it to Mr. Jockin here. And it's very interesting because it would seem as if 
the only possibility of a genuine response is some sort of commit committed openness, some sort of open commitment, which by definition is a paradox, but it's an openness from a commitment. And it's almost like the only way to handle the demand from the other is from a commitment. Otherwise, it overwhelms you and crushes you. It's like you have to go through the sirens, but have the wax in your ear, which you know, you have to go through that and the only way to handle the real of Lacan. Because this is the funny thing. If relationship is the only way to have the open system, as I'll call it, the open commit, I'll say open commitment at this point because we're playing the game of language and building a bond. It's fun, right? It's all sublative. Sublative or whatever the S word is you is. Um, Sigma from Mega Man. Uh, so, you know, there's this kind of open commitment, which if Cheetan was here, I know wherever he is right now, he's looking up and say, he's like, Negan Tropic. It's Negan Tropic, the reverse of entropy. So it's almost like the only way to work against entropy is from an open commitment, which by definition requires a relationship because that is unplannable, only something you can prepare for, which means it requires the threat of the real, Lacan. Therefore, the very condition of encountering the real of Lacan, the lack, is precisely the encounter of the opening of the river hole, as Cadell has put it, of the Negan Tropic. The real is through which the Negan Tropophy comes through, that you can then live and have this energy and have this kind of excellence and time energy. And it can only be from a condition where you, as a conscious being with your psychic energy, is relating with the exterior world so that you are not dominated into a closed system ergo conclusion that is then susceptible to entropy, but become a point by which Negan Tropophy can come into existence, which is only possible in accordance with a situation of open commitment that requires the other. And that then is a different, um, well-roundedness will not necessarily help you with that. In fact, it may make you oblivious to all that, unless by well-rounded we mean something uh, that makes us more human and able to exist in community. But let me give it to Mr. Thomas Jockin. Mr. Jockin. Great points as always, gang. So actually, Luber, I'm glad you're back in the group because uh, I, didn't hit, I didn't actually give answer to what was my response to my students, right? Because I know you've been picking up this idea a bunch of times, this idea of the students who say I'm a bunch of fragmented person personas right in my different relationships you, you know because I know I think it was from Philip I wrote this down right or I think it was I think it was Philip I believe or or Luber actually the multitasking right ideally I actually I actually got this from self-help books he's a complete blowhard but but you know grand, uh, grand Cardone he has actually surprisingly some good ideas in a bat in a bunch of bad shit <laughs> in the South Health world. Um, there, I think one, I think it's very powerful is the idea, you know, like in technology, there's discussion of technology stacks, like how you stacking technologies to max out for productivity purposes or for certain, uh, certain kind of maxing. I do think from Chris's, from Chris, Car from Grant Cardone, the idea of activity stacking, meaning don't just do an action for its own outcome, like locked in. Ask the question, how are you doing this activity? Is she helping you get other benefits for your other activities? For example, um, I'm going to a classic example. When I was when I was young, when I first started teaching, teaching wasn't just for the paycheck. No, it was to help cultivate content and ideas that I wanted to explore and have a laboratory with students to develop them, for example. So from that, that was that built up into research projects for me. And then from the research, pro and then also, by the way, my, a lot of my, my invention of philosophy came from this. Basically, I started talking about philosophical ideas of virtue related to design. Those generated into basically all of my research that came after that. So notice here, this is like an activity stack of, and it's really interesting because it's not like, trust me, it's not like I have any fixed idea of at the time. It's a responsiveness. You kind of have, it's almost like the very beginning, Daniel, I think you brought it up. You can't really plan for the beautiful, but you can certainly ask the question, do I have a beautiful life, right? And it kind of sets you up for a context to kind of, if you have a certain awareness of these, all the different dimensions of your life, how can you stack them into a unity that in the, and basically the gathering of all those activities that are distinct and different from one perspective, they have absolutely nothing related to each other. Yet from your creative act of understanding, you can see that they're one activity that it stack and build and amplify. So it basically becomes like the end, the discussion is a flywheel or any kind of lever or leveraged, you hear the word leverage used a lot. It does have utility because you have limited time and energy. So don't think about your activities as just a one-off action to get a paycheck, for example. Think about how those activities can stack on top of each other to create leverage and momentum 
and movement to get you to where you want to go in a long term. I do think in self-help, that's a very useful tool. And another one, just to share, because we've been kind of playing with this idea a little bit of the quantity and quality game. There is something interesting about that, because another thing from, Chris, from Grant Cardone is the 10x rule. It's a very simple heuristic. It basically says we're horrible at planning shit. We are absolutely horrendous at expecting how much pain will cost to do something, how much money will cost something, how much time, how much effort. We always are biased to presume less than required. So whatever number you think, meaning you want the one job, you don't apply to one job. You apply, you actually realize, wait a minute, get that one job, I probably need 10 interviews. Get those 10 interviews, I probably need 100 applications. So in reality, you're not, you're basically getting your expectations set up. You're basically, you're like almost mechanically saying, I'm a feeble human, I have a bias, and I'm just going to apply a 10x rule to basically every expectation I have. And on that operation, basically you're working with exposure. So this is a very Nassim Taleb kind of model of activity where you're basically saying, I'm, expo I'm increasing my exposure to get outcome, a benefit, right? Um, these are all from self-help language. And it's very, so while a lot of it's nonsense and a lot of productivity and hustle culture, I totally agree with that. There's something very powerful. I think it fundamentally comes down to it's your, while I agree with absolutely the question of relationship is absolutely essential. There's also a relation to yourself. And I think that, you know, the Stephen Covey stuff, there's actually so much penetrative power in it. If we get past a normie kind of reading of it. Because there's a reason why the first three habits are about the self. It's your commitment and integrity to yourself that gives the foundation to get on the relationship with others in integrity, right? So your relation to yourself with the and most fundamental point, and the reason why the, the literally the first habit is a mo be proactive. Set your framework to be one of a self-action to not be acted upon, that you're this fragmented bunch of personas. I'm a teller here. I'm a, I go to the gym here. I'm a brother here. I'm a husband here. Ask the question, what is the unity? What is the actions in all those interact and all those relations that can give a unity, that kind of build up and target, that reinforce each other? And it might require a certain framework of kind of asking that prompt. Is my life beautiful? It changes the question a lot. I, I've asked, I've, in my friends of their greatest despair, I've asked that question and that response they get, the response is powerful because it's very much like it, it commands something very powerful inside of them. If they take that seriously to realize, no, this is not a beautiful life. And they have to, and it's because they don't have the sense of unity. They have had this horrendous this, this disintegration. It just like can't conflict and, and breakage, um, for example. Um, so I'm just meditating on this point. So ultimately this kind of harmony of disparate, of disparate units which is a kind of question of quantity and quality and how they harmonize together. So I'll close with that. I think that's excellent. Um, a few things come to mind. I definitely found it could be more useful to ask, uh, is my life beautiful versus is my life meaningful? Meaningful is more likely to stay in the philosophical consciousness of abstraction. But if you ask if it's beautiful, that has a different resonance and can bring different things out. So I think that what you're asking is exactly right. To uh, Philip's point also, I think it's it's very true that asking who am I is a very bad question because you're asking for a category and that's in the realm of philosophical consciousness. What am I starts getting at what am I? And Raymond and Samuel have talked and, and, uh, and uh, Joshua, Mr. Hansen have talked before that when Socrates says know thyself, it's more in the context of like a challenge, gymnastic, like know yourself, see if you can climb that mountain or not. Like that's how you know yourself. And I definitely think it's just a practical piece of advice. If you want to know who you are, do that which you think is impossible for you to do. You will then find out what you are made of. And so taking on that thing that strikes you as impossible is a wonderful test to start arriving at a meaningful and concrete answer to the question of who are you, because you now can reference it to if you're someone who can go against and face the impossible or not. And I think at the end of the day, and I'll give it to Javier here, um, I think at the end of the day, it's basically two options for who you are. You're either entropic or you're negentropic. You're either an energy system or you are you're heading toward completion uh, or you are uh, concluded and closed. And I would say to Andrews, too, where we have a world of stories that all conclude, then our art is teaching us to be in the image and likeness of stories that conclude. And so we are not complete. And so we end up entropic, 
versus Negan Tropic. So I think there are consequences. And also to the point that Javier was saying earlier, and then I'll give to him, we definitely are in a culture that uses energy to make products versus energy to make energy. And this seems to be the difference that we are describing. What we need is a culture that uses energy to make energy. We talk about reusable energy. I think metaphorically, that's a problem. We may want to talk about re-energizable energy, energy that can re-energize. And that's reusable, but it's also not merely in the logic of exchange and commodities. But let me give it to Javier Rivera. Mr. Rivera, please. Yeah, I mean, just just real quickly um, uh, to finish my, my comments. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Jockin that you have to begin with a relationship to yourself. And I think Buber would also agree. I think the problem with self-help book and productivity is that the promise is that you'll end with yourself. You begin with yourself and you end with yourself. That's that's the part that yeah. is obscured. Because it's closed. And, and it's, yeah. And it's, and it's hard to argue or convince somebody out of that because in some sense, yes, you're supposed to begin with yourself but you're not supposed to end with yourself. And that is the problematic feature of everything <laughs> else. Um, and, and I like these questions that Jockin is asking because it's, it's not a closed question, it's an open question, it's a demand, it's a response. Is your life beautiful? You don't go, oh no, it's not. Oh no, it's helpless. Oh, because see, you're already beginning with yourself and you're ending with yourself. That is how the question becomes negatively spurious spurious whatever um so it's very quick and it's very easy to fall into that negative spurious question which we have to be very careful it's good to ask the question where are you who are or what am i you know but don't answer it in the sense of ending with yourself it's meant to provoke and move you towards leaving eventually leaving yourself um but, you know, I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's my, my response. That's excellent. And I, I like the point also you were saying from uh, Mr. Davood, uh, Mr. Gosley, on the idea of you, looking at self-help as a kind of call. That's excellent. I think that's exactly right, because what ends up happening is we're self back to self. Uh, but then there's the self to other to other that's spurious. The true relation in Hegel is the negentropic system where I'm relating to you. I'm committed, so I'm standing firm. It's not going to be spurious, but you are open, so there's an infinity. Now there's a true infinity, so we can have a negentropic system. If it's a spurious, it's entropic. And if it's isolated, it's entropic. So there is something about the open, the open commitment, which is negentropic, that requires the relation that then can have the true infinity. And now what? It's like a wheel turning wheel. It's a circle relating to itself. It's the Nietzsche wheel turning the wheel. And it, the, the model is some sort of psychic energy moving thanks to metabolism in connection with an other that is not reducible, that because it is not reducible, it can be an infinite source of consideration. And in light of that infinite source of consideration can be a call on you to change infinitely in light of that relation. And that's negentropic now, as opposed to entropic. And this seems to be what is required for a regaining of time energy as opposed to garbage time. And maybe this would start to get at some of the ways we can think of to, to close. I'm uh, Alas, I will have to run and I've enjoyed this immensely. This has been a joy. Thank you all for being here. Um, it may bring to light, because I've been trying to think more and more of how Deleuze and Lacan and all these things can go together because I'm an idiot, but these things are really concerning. And I love what Mr. Mikey Downs was saying the other day. It's almost like the child starts off um, looking for connections, creative Deleuze, desire is just interested in connections, right? And we naturally do that. What I think occurs is the lack of peers in the encounter of the other as a das ding, as Richard Bufri says. So you get older and then you're like, wow, the other can be disappointed in me. And I have no control over if they're disappointed in me. And so you lack the other, right? Which brings out your lack of the ability to incorporate the other. So then you tend to withdraw, okay? So you withdraw. What you have to do is get back to being a child in light of das ding. Whereas before you were delusian per se, because you had not encountered dusting. The trick is to somehow go through lack to get back to a childlikeness that is negentropic because now it is in relation to the other person and the lack of Lacan then becomes an opening to make the delusian motivation that you had as a child negentropic. 
Now it is infinite. And now it is not fragile because the existence and encounter of the other will not make you withdrawal because it will not make you interfere in isolation and uncertainty, which then would make you closed, which would then make you entropic. And that would mean you are concluded in death, in self-effacement in this loss of energy. And so we start as children that are deluse, then we encounter the other, feel disappointment, which leads to the feeling of the lack in the real. But that lack is actually an opening when we come to not be afraid of the other. And as and usually, basically, most people never get through that. They look for categories, they look for ways to kind of avoid the other because it's too painful. But if we can work through the other and say, no, I'm going to be childlike, even though there's other people who may be disappointed in me. I'm going to be committed to that childlikeness and that creativity in the presence of the other person. So now there's a relation. And because there's a relation, there's an opening that now makes it possible for this childlikeness to be negantropic. And the lack of Lacan now can be a river hole for an infinite negantropic source of that delusion motivation that we start off with would lose when we encounter the other as a kind of dusting, as a kind of source of disappointment, because we work through that in courage, rising to the occasion to see if we know who we are by actually facing that challenge like the gymnasium. And if we can rise to that occasion, the lack of the inability to incorporate the other person is then the opening of the opportunity to make life ever creative in light of the love and the beauty and the truth and the goodness of that connection. This has been a joy. Thank you, everyone. I, we're going to run off to the grocery store now.